Today we're going to be learning Sukkah Daf Kafchet. Today's Daf is dedicated by Faye Schwartz, Li'iloi Nishmat Avi, her father, Moshe Schwartz, Yaakov Moshe Ben Harav Chaim Klonimus, on the twenty five on the twenty fifth year site of his passing. My father was an each time who possessed tremendous emuna, despite the many hardships he encountered throughout his life. He was Kovea Itim and managed to complete the Daf Yomi cycle multiple times, notwithstanding his working long hours six days a week. He taught by example and imbued all of his children with a love of learning and the importance of Gamilu Chasadi. We're going to start very apropos for today's staff because our beginning of our Gemara is going to start off with learning by example. So beginning with um, the beginning of Kavchet Amud Aleph, we were learning about Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Lazar ben Horkin, if you remember. And the last thing we saw was this interesting story with him and Rabbi Yochanan Rabbi Eli, who was... Um, it's Rabbi Yochanan, right? Get the name right. Um, I believe it was Rabbi Yochanan, but Rabbi Eli. Um, in any case, they were in the sukkah and he didn't want to tell him about the, I'm just trying to find it. Yeah. He didn't want to tell him not to put the sheet on top because it was something he hadn't heard from his rabbi. So now we're going to see another story about this. Tano Rabbanan, a, not exactly a story, but a bright that talks about this idea about Rabbi Elizabeth Horker's not saying things he didn't learn from his rabbi. Okay, so in other words, he had some ideas of his own, but those he didn't want to say, he only would say things and teach things that he had received by tradition. He spent Shabbat in the Galil, in the upper Galilee. They asked him 30 questions about Hilchot Sukkah. 12 of them he said, I have a tradition about, 18 of them he apparently wouldn't answer because he said, I never heard I didn't know, don't have a tradition about it. Rabbi Yassi, Rabbi Yehuda, Omer, he says, no, you got the, the, the details a little confused. It was the opposite. There were 18 he knew, and 12 that he didn't. Amrulo, what, you don't say anything ever that you haven't learned from, from a tradition? Amar lahem, He's kiktani lomar davar You're forcing me now. In other words, in answering your question, I'm going to have to say something I never heard from my rabbi. It's almost like he's joking around a little bit, but you'll hear. He says, I'm going to now tell you a list of things that I do. And these are things that I came up with on my own. I didn't learn. I didn't get them in a tradition specifically. Although we're going to see later that he did learn most of these things by example. Okay, that's why I said about faith, dedication, that it's more that he learned by example rather than when it comes to halachic things. So those he wouldn't say unless he heard it from his rabbi. But when it comes to how to behave and, and specifically about learning Torah mostly, that he learned more by watching, by example. So he now says, in answer to your question, do you really never say anything that you never heard from your rabbi? He says, well, now you're forcing me to answer your question. I'm going to have to answer you in a way that I'm going to tell you things that I've learned on my own. And as I didn't hear them directly from anyone, but We'll see that he really did learn them from others. So now, um, here goes his list. I was always the first one in the Beit Midrash in the morning. I never slept in the Beit Midrash, not a deep sleep and not a little nap. Okay, this re- reminds us of the whole sugya about sleeping in the sukkah, Keva Shenadarai. It also reminds me of my days when I used to learn the Beit Midrash. Anyone who's sat learning all day knows what it's like to sit in the Beit Midrash and not actually need to take a nap during the day. That's actually a big challenge, right? When you're physically active and doing things, it's a little bit easier to keep awake. But sometimes when you're just sitting learning, it's very easy for you to just easily doze off. So it's actually a really big feat that he never slept in the Beit Midrash. I was never left anyone in the Beit Midrash, meaning I was always the last to leave. First to come, last to leave, never took a nap, never slept in the Beit Midrash. And I never had a conversation that wasn't a conversation of Torah. If that sounds why, pretty extreme. And the fact that I don't say anything, right? I don't ever say anything that I didn't hear from my teacher. Now, that line, he didn't exactly learn from his teacher. He didn't, it, he didn't get a tradition that you're not supposed to say anything that you didn't learn unless by tradition. That wasn't a tradition that he got from anyone else, but it is something he intuited was the right thing to do. 
Amru alav Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. Now we're going to see that they said the same thing about Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. Why is this important? Or some of the same things and some other things as well. Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai was Rabbi Eliezer's teacher. And this is where we're going to see that Rabbi Eliezer clearly learned by example these things from his own teacher. The order is going to be a little different. He never spoke a conversation that wasn't about Torah. He never walked four cubits without Torah, without tefillin. Nobody ever came before him to the Beit Midrash. He never took any nap in the Beit Midrash or even, or, or a deep sleep, obviously. He never thought about words of Torah when he was in a dirty place, felt like that was inappropriate. He never left anyone in the Beit Midrash and left, meaning he was always the last to leave. No one ever found him sitting there silent, not doing anything. He was always sitting learning. He's the one who would physically go and open the door to his students, right? He had this humility about him. It didn't, didn't bother him to go open the door for other people. And particularly his students, he would go and open the door out of respect for them, right? When really they're supposed to be opening the door for him. And he also never said anything. He never heard from his own rabbi, which is obviously where Rabbi Lezabin Horkinus got this from. He never told people, okay, time to go home from the Beit Midrash. We actually saw this in Pesachim. There were two days a year where they would tell people to go home. Erev Pesach and Erev Yom Kippur. So I don't remember if it came up in the Gemara there, but but um, I remember the skills class that, that we have sitting on our site. If anyone's interested, it's a good, good time to promote it. If anyone's interested in learning basic Amara skills, there's a skills class on our site. There's, it's in the section called courses. You can take a course on your own. It's all on, um, it's, it was a Zoom class, but everything is recorded and it's built for online study with Chavruta and Shi'or. There's like three YouTube clips with two Chavruta time periods for each class. And with source with study sheets. So anyway, this source appears there. I remember, which is this issue about there. It talks about that you're um, you're supposed to grab the matzahs from the children. Um, it's a whole thing. It's not exactly clear what exactly it means. Actually, you're supposed to grab the matzah from the children. What does it mean? So there's all different opinions. Um, and one of the opinions, and it comes from here, is that they would send people home on Erev Pesach. They wanted to make sure the kids ate matzah at night. So they would make sure the kids slept during the day. So they'd be up to eat the matzah at night. And in order to ensure the kids would sleep during the day, they would send the husbands home from the Beit Midrash to go make sure their kids went to bed. Some people say, no, no, that's not why. They sent them home to do the Korban Pesach. They had to deal with Korban Pesach on Pesach afternoon. Right? That's Erev Pesach. On Erev Pesach afternoon, they would do the sacrifice. That's why they had to leave early or maybe get ready for the Seder, all different possible explanations. And Erev Yom Kippurim, because they had to go eat, right? They had to eat on Erev Yom Kippur before the fast. And likewise, Rabbi Eliezer, his student, did like he did. Tanu Rabbanan. Another thing we're going to get to about Rabbi Yon, now we're going to talk about Rabbi Yonchadam and Zakai. Interestingly enough, this has a bit of a similar structure to the first bright we saw today. He had 80 students. Shloshim, this is Hillel, the famous Hillel and Shammai, the one who was at the Hillel that was uh, uh, leaning through the, the skylight to hear Torah when they wouldn't let him in the Beit Midrash. That Hillel. He had 80 students. 30 of them were, were um, how do you say, it? worthy that the Shekhinah should rest upon them, Kim Moshe Rabbeinu, like Moshe. 30 of them were worthy, less than the first group, but also very worthy, that the sun could have stopped for them, like Yoshua bin Nun. And Esrim bin Oniim. And then there were 20 in between. Usually bin Oni is like, not so great, not so bad. But here we mean bin Oni in between the ones that were like Moshe and the ones that were like Yoshua. The greatest among them was Yonatan bin Uziel. He was the least of all of his students, okay? So Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was this great rabbi, was the lowest of the 80 students. That just shows, we're going to see this inside, shows how great his students were. 
Amualav. Now let's see how great Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai was. Amualav of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai. Shaloinyach mikha u Mishnah. He didn't leave over a, a pasuk, a Mishnah, Gemara, a piece of Gemara. Halachot. Okay, there was no Gemara in his day. Gemara means right analysis of Mishnayot. Halachot, which could be halacha la Moshe Sinai. Agadot, agada, right stories. Um, Dikduke Torah or, or agadot could also be midrashim, right? Uh, Dikduke Torah when we analyze the Torah and get from there to halacha. Dikduke Sofrim, rabbinic, um, rabbinic explanations or understandings. Kalim vechamorim, kavachomers. Gzerot shavot, we know it's gzerot shavot when you compare two verses and learn from one to the other. Kufot, understanding the different times of year or like astronomical astronomy type things. Gematria, right, which are relevant to halacha. Gematriot, that's taking the value of the letters then the number value. Sich, now we get to stranger things. Sicham alachei asharet, conversations between angels. Vesichat sheidim, and conversations of evil spirits, meaning he knew how to speak to them in some kind of way. Sichat um, kalim, tree, trees talking to each other. And what exactly this means is very unclear. Mishalot kovsim, okay, mashal, parables. Parables of the washers. Okay, apparently there were group types of parables. Mishalot shualim, parables of foxes. Okay, again, fox parables. These are all types of parables that existed then. Davar gadol davar katan. Okay, any big thing and little thing. What is davar gadol davar katan? Davar gadol ma'asem merkava. Okay, that's the the psukim in Yechezkel about when he went up to the heavens and saw the angels, which is very hard to understand. Very few people understand that. Davar katan, havayot abaya verava. Okay, this might make you feel a little bad, but small things are like the conversations that Abaya and Rava have, okay, which to us are complicated and we have trouble understanding them. That was small to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai. Obviously, Abaya and Rava weren't alive in his day. But we mean those types of conversations. They're using that as a catchphrase for something that people in the time of the Amoraim understand what that means. Likayem mashenema, okay, this was the, with these, all these rabbis were, were it was the, the Pasuk, this Pasuk in Mishle was fulfilled. In other words, I'm going to fill, right? This is to give, to, to pass on the Torah. They were able to be the ones to pass on the Torah and fill up my, my storage houses. Okay, and as Otsro Tehem, sorry, God will fill up their storage houses with lots of arsenal of knowledge and information and ways to get the Torah across to their students. Okay, so with this, um, we see how great he was. And now we're going to say, If this is the smallest among them, think about how great Yonatan ben Uziel must have been. And in fact, Yonatan ben Uziel, any while he was learning Torah, any bird that flew overhead was immediately burned. Rashi says, why burned? Because all the Malachim even came to hear his Torah and they were fiery, you know, they're fiery, those angels, and that caused the, the birds to burn. Okay, moving on now, that was ending our section with Rabbi Leazar Horkonos. We learned more about his opinions about Sukkah yesterday. Today, it was more about what kind of person he was and where he learned what he learned from. Mishnah. This Mishnah is made of two parts. It's important to separate because the first part is something we've already learned about Rosh Rubo Shulchano. All the discussions of the Gemara on that were at the beginning of the Masechet. The Gemara is not going to even talk about it at all because it's already been dealt with. The second part is going to be more interesting, which is, again, the first part is interesting as well. We just learned it already. The second part is about, number one, women's obligation in Sukkah, and then children and the like. Okay. If the majority of your body and your head is in the sukkah and your tables in the house, Beit Shammai Poslim, Beit Shammai said, this is no good. You need your your table in the house, in the sukkah, sorry. You need table in the sukkah. That would be, as we said many times, seven by seven hand breaths. Beit Shammai says, no, this says this is totally fine. Your shulchan does not need to be in the sukkah. That would be a six by six hand breath sukkah. Amulahem betilel le Beit Shammai. Beit Shammai, betilel, now say to Beit Shammai, lo kach hayam aseh. Can't we prove it from a story like we saw Rabbi Yehuda do many times? Betilel, now say, here was a story. Kach hayam aseh, shachuz iknei Beit Shammai, yuz iknei Betilel, right? Our is kenim, and your is kenim, right? Our elders went levakeret Rabbi Yochanan ben Achoranit. They went to his sukkah. 
They found him sitting, the majority of his body in the sukkah and his head in the sukkah, but his table was in the house. And nobody said anything to him. So there you see, Beit Hillel says, obviously, if it was a problem, they would have said something. And this is classic in stories. Well, they say, Beit Shammai, you don't, Beit Shammai says to him, you don't really remember the details. Mishama, Aya, what, this is your proof? Do you don't remember the details there? They said to him, if this is the way, if this is what you're doing, you're not actually fulfilling the mitzvah. In other words, they did say something. You don't remember the story. You Maybe you are the story from your elders who thought he was okay. We are the story from our elders and our elders told him, no way, no how. Next part of the mission. Women, Canaanite slaves, and Children are exempt from sukkah. Katan, we're going to see why in the Gemara. Katan sheno tzarich li'imo chayab b'sukkah. But if a child already doesn't need his mother, then he's obligated to sukkah. This goes back with a whole slew of cases that we've talked about many times. That when it comes to children, it's not just 12, 13 in, in Mishneh Kalacha, but it went based on what stage of life you were up to and whether how you how capable you were of fulfilling the mitzvah. If you no longer need your mother, then you can already sit in a sukkah. Um, there was a case that happened and Shammai's daughter-in-law had a baby. He moved away the, the headboards, the, the, you know, the ceiling. He moved them away, separated them and basically put a schach up so that the baby would be in a sukkah. Okay. We're going to have to get to the story at the end and figure out why on earth did he think that a baby was high in sukkah. Certainly isn't the katam cheno tzarich limo. The Gemara starts off mananimili. Where do we get it from that women are exempt from sukkah? Now, if you read the, if you learned the sugya in Kiddushin, famous sugya about what are mitzvot asay shazman grama, time bound commandments. Women are generally exempt from time bound commandments. What are they? The first one on the list is sukkah. So you would simply say it's a time bound commandment. But that's not what the Gemara is going to say here. And we're going to have to try to figure out how does this Gemara reconcile with the Gemara in Kiddushin? Okay, it's not going to be very clear. I'm going to suggest a possible answer, but I'll raise it as even a more basic question. Minani mile, ditanu rabanan, ezrach, okay, it says, kol ezrach bi Yisrael, yeshvu besukot. Okay, every citizen of Israel sits in a sukkah. So what is, why does it say ha ezrach? It could just say kol ezrach, every citizen. Kol ha ezrach means every the citizen. It's actually a little hard to translate. So ezrach is ezrach. If you just said it's rough, that would be men, women, any citizen. Ha'ezrach lo tziyat anashim. The citizen comes to say, not women. And that's where we get it from. Kol ha'ezrach, because it says, all lirabot et haktanim, to include the children. So now we're going to go more in depth into this. Amar mar, ha'ezrach lo tziyat anashim. Lememra, is that to say, de'ezrach, that if you just have ezrach, it would mean ben nashim ben gvarim, mashma? Right, that includes men and women, and then Ha'ezrah comes to exclude the women. But we're going to show the exact reverse happens in Yom Kippur. Tanya says in a Ha Ha'ezrah, there it also uses the word Ha'ezrah, lirabot et hanashim ha'ezrachiyot shechayavot b'inoi. There, Ha'ezrah comes to say women are included in the mitzvah of Inoi. Women also need a fast in Yom Kippur. Alma ezrah gavre mashma. From there, you can infer that Ezrach means just men. Ha'ezrach comes to say also women. So how can we reconcile this? So Amar Rabba, Hilchata Ninu V'asrochinu Rabbanan Akai. What Rabba says is, know this, one is Ahalacha Lamosh Musinai, and the other is, I'm sorry, uh, one is derived actually from the verses. That's not what Rabba is referring to. But Rabba says it's Hilchata Ninu, this one of these is really just we don't really learn it from the verse. The, the rabbis just connected it with the verse. Okay, so meaning one of them is learned directly from the verses and one of them is just connected to the verses loosely, but really it's just, it's a tradition that was passed down. So now they say, okay, well, one in one, which one is which? Hey, crap, hey, which one is learned directly from the verse? Yom Kippur or Sukkot, and which one is learned from the Halach Lamash Messina? V2, and additionally, Kra Lamali. What do we need the Pasuk for? The Hilchata Lamali. What do we need the Halacha for? It's obvious, both of these. This is where we're going to get to. Hasukam, it's Vada Seshazman Grama. 
isn't mitzvah a time-bound commandment? The whole mitzvah to say shazman graman hashim p'tirot. All women are exempt from time-bound commandments. So Yom Kippurim, and additionally Yom Kippurim, we don't need a specific pasuk to say women are obligated because we already learned that from Rav Yehuda in the name of Rav. He said, and also is in a brighter from the house of Rabbi Ishmael. Amarka, the pasuk says, Ish Ish O Isha. Okay, this is a pasuk in uh, Bamidbar, Parake. She talks about Ish O Isha, he asumi ko chatota adam, sin, lim o mal ba Hashem, the sin of Me'ila. But there it says, Ish O Isha, that do a sin. From there they learn, Hishva katuv Ish Isha le Ish, lechol onashim shabbat Torah. From here we learn, for all punishments in the Torah, women are the same as men, meaning, all negative commandments, women are obligated. So of course they're obligated for Enoi on Yom Kippur, not eating on Yom Kippur. It's a low tasse. Of course they're part of that. So basically he's saying, what do you need a Pasuk for? What do you need a Halacha Lamosh Misinai for? Both, and that's the first question was, which do we learn from, right? Which is a Halacha, which is, a, is learned from the Pasuk? And, we, and also, and it's, which is a tradition, which is derived from the first actually. And in addition, why do we even need Either of those, it's obvious that women are exempt from sukkah, misvah das shasman grama, time bound, pos, um, time bound, positive time bound commandment, and and yom kippur. Obviously, they're obligated because women are part of all all things that have punishments, and yom kippur has punishment associated with it. They're all they're all part of it. So Amar Abai, we're going to have two answers. Abai and Rava, laolam sukkah hilchata. The sukkah is the one that's halacha lemosh misinai. It's learned by tradition. Why do you need it? If women are exempt from all time by mitzvah, what's the point? You might have thought you're supposed to sit in the sukkah. It says teshvu basukkah. Teshvu, they learn like you normally live. Just like you live in your house with your wife. Also, you should live in your sukkah with your wife. In fact, we're going to learn at the end of the, the end of today's staff. You're supposed to go into your sukkah with your nice fancy dishes and all your fancy sheets and everything else. And uh, you know, you would think what you're bringing all that stuff. And of course, you're going to also have your wife with you, right? It seems weird. But you wouldn't have your wife. That's why there's a lechel and mosh that says, no, in fact, women are exempt. Rava Amar eats three. Rava says, for a different reason, you need it. Maybe because of this Zerah Sheva that we saw yesterday, the Chamishasa, Chamishasa from Chag Amatzot. Mala Hala Nashim Chayavot, just like women are obligated in eating matzah the first night of Pesach. And that's because whoever can't eat chametz is obligated to eat matzah. Afkan Nashim Chayavot, you might have thought they're also obligated here to sit in the sukkah. Ka Mashmalan, therefore, comes to teach you that they're not. So now I'll ask you, why are women exempt from sukkah? So you could say, it's period. But what about the fact that the Sugin Kiddushin says that it's a time-bound commandment? It's on that list of time-bound commandments that women are exempt from. So one possible way to understand this is some sort of combination of the two. That what this is saying is, it's really that women, it's a time-bound commandment. And that's why women are exempt. Really, Teshvu came to do, theoretically, you should, because that's the way you eat in your house and, and with your wife. So the women should also be in the sukkah. And also, or go with Rava. It's like matzah, and they should. But comes halacha l'moshe misinai to say, and then both those would say, this is an exception to the rule of mitzvah rase shazman grama, time-bound commandments that women are exempt from. This is an exception, you would have thought. Comes the halacha l'moshe misinai to reinstate the, the, um, the mitzvah rase shazman grama and to say, no, despite that, they're still exempt. That's one way to reconcile these two together. If you don't do that, then you could simply say there's two different approaches. One is to say that women are exempt because it's a time and commandment. That's what it says in Kiddushin. And a different one is to say it's halacha l'mosh misina. The problem is that we generally say halacha l'mosh misina is there aren't machlokot about. So it would be hard to say that there's actually a machlokot about whether there's halacha l'mosh misina about this or not. But in any case, that's I'm going to leave you with a bit of an open question and a possible way to answer it. But possible that there, this is off the track of um, Mitzvah Rasa Shazman Grama, and it's a different track of Halach HaLamosh Messina, or possibly they work together, as I explained before. Okay, next. Um, 
So we still now, once you say Sukkah halacha l'mashem Sinai, then why does it say kol ha'ezrach in the Pasuk? Right? It's true we connected it to women, but really there must be some other reason on a Doraita level. L'rabot et ha'girim, it's to include converts. Now, if you remember, we actually darshaned ha'ezrach in yesterday's class about that it's maybe a ger shenit gayer in the middle or a katan shehigdil in the middle, right? A child who became obligated and mitzvot in the middle. But here they learn it differently. They say it's to include converts in general. It's a very strange thing. Why would you think not to include converts in the mitzvah of sukkah? So the Gemara says, Salkadat hachamina ha'ezrach b'Yisrael amarach lana. It said the ezrach in Israel. So maybe it means to exclude gerim, lo et ha'gerim. So therefore, kamash malan, no, so the kol ha'ezrach comes to right, include also converts, or ha'ezrach, the word ha'ezrach, comes to include converts. Maybe you would think to exclude them because it's to remember what our forefathers did. Of course, Girim are obligated in all sorts of things for remembering, even though it wasn't their forefathers. So still a little strange. Um, in any case, the conclusion is Girim were included, and maybe they're just trying to come up with something that it would include, and therefore they come up with that. Yom Kippuri. So now we already go back to our original question. We already learned it from the fact that women are part of all mitzvah lotas. So what are the answer? It's for the tosefet. Just like this tosefet Shabbat, we add on extra minutes to Shabbat. We also add on extra minutes before at the beginning and the end of Yom Kippur. Okay, women are part of that. Now, why would you think they're not? Since there's no punishment for Tosefet. And there's no warning in the Torah that you have to keep this Tosefet. You might have thought women aren't obligated in that because they're only obligated in things that there's punishments associated with it and warnings. Kamash Malan comes to teach you they are in fact included. That's why we need the diverse the Ha'ezrach in Yom Kippur to include the women. Amar Right, so just as a summary, the pasuk kol ha'ezrach, uh, sorry, ha'ezrach by Yom Kippur is to include women, and that's directly learned out from the verse that kol, the sorry, forget kol, ezrach would just be men. Ha'ezrach comes to include women. When it comes to sukkah, it's all learned halachah l'moshem Sinai. It's connected to the verse, and they use the reverse logic of ezrach would just be men, uh, would be men and women. Ha'ezrach would be to exclude women. But it's not really derived from there. It's just connected to that verse, so we remember. It's a little bit weird to remember it in a way that's the opposite of the way it, it's actually used in Yom Kippur, but we'll have to leave it at that, right? That, that we can't start asking questions about. I mean, we can ask, but we don't really have an answer. Now we're going to get to the Ketani. Amarma, kol rabot taktani. Bahatna nashim vavadim ketanim pturim asuka, but doesn't it say, Women and slaves and ketanim are p'tulim and asuka. So the drasha before, when we said about the women, where do we learn it from? And then we said, ha'ezrach comes to exclude women. Kol comes to include ketanim. But ketanim, we already said, minors are exempt. So lo kasha, kam katan shigiel l'chinuch, kam katan shalo yigiel l'chinuch. There's what we call laws of chinuch, which is once a katan is an age where he can understand something or she can understand, they're already obligated in the mitzvah. So they say, if the katan is already at the age where the, they have understanding, then we have to teach them to sit in the sukkah. So we sit them in the sukkah. But when not, and that's the exemption is, right, the exemption in our Mishnah was if they're not yet a chinuk. And the obligation in that trasha called to include tanim are when they got to the age of chinuk. So now they say, wait a minute. Katan shigiel the chinuk mid rabbanan hu. They say, but that's only the rabbanan. The rabbi said, once you understand, so then we have to teach them, right, in order that they know once they're obligated. But that's only Durabanan. So we can't learn that out from a verse. So they say, no, me Durabanan across Machtaba Almahu. Just like with the women, right? It's it's a rabbinic thing. And yes, the, the rabbis just connected it to a verse so we remember it. Okay. Now let's get into the Mishnah, distinguish between a katan she no tzarich limo and katan she tzarich limo, right? Once a katan is a no tzarich limo, he's already obligated in sukkah. katan she no tzarich limo, what would be this case? How would you know? He goes to the bathroom and his mother doesn't need to wipe him anymore. Anyone who wakes up, it doesn't call for their mother when they wake up. So now they say, wait a minute, this is a great sugi as a mother, like to think about what, when your child is at the age where they don't need their mother anymore, right? I sometimes need my mother for things even at this age, right? So now, Gidolim nami karule ima. Uh, they're saying, but older kids also call their mother. 
Okay, not always necessarily right when they wake up, but maybe, you know, sometimes they wake up and they, they call out their mother, they need something. So what do they say? It's so when the kid calls, ima, ima, right? When you call twice, it's that, it's that little kid scream that we always remember, right? If you have little kids, you know it. If you've had little kids, you've heard it, right? Or you've seen others, it's like that. Ima, Ima, right? That I need you now. So that's like a little kid. That kind of kid is not obligated in sukkah. Okay, you have to wonder whether it's a connection. The fact that women aren't obligated, the children who need the mothers, need the mothers and want to be in the house with the mothers, therefore they're not in the sukkah. It seems to be connected. Masevi al kalato. Now we get to the strange case of bitch of Shammai has a king. Masevi stole. Is this coming to contradict? And bitch and Shammai himself thought that little children, babies have to eat in the sukkah. So they say, it really is missing words. And this is how it should read. Shammai Machmil. He was super careful about this, right? He was extra, took extra steps here. By the way, it sounds like he even put the schach on the bed. The bed itself became the sukkah. Okay, or maybe it was just above the bed. Mishnah. By the way, Shammai has all these interesting shitot about babies fasting. We saw this in, in Yoma. It's all connected to his tfisa about little kids. They're, they're supposed to be part of mitzvot in general, even though they're very young. So the Mishnah says, all seven days of Sukkot, you have to turn your house into your, your sukkah, into your main place, and your house should be your temporary abode. Yarduk Shamim, what if it rains? When can you leave the sukkah? You have this cooked dish, like somewhat hard, somewhat soft, somewhat in between, and it starts to get ruined from the rain. That's when you get to go inside. They made a parable about this. What is this like? When it rains on Sukkot, it's this very bad sign. It's like someone who goes to pour a cup of wine for their for their master and their master throws it in his face, right? It's like we do all this effort, we build a sukkah, we wanna build this beautiful house that we're gonna sit and kind of worship God in it, right? And the way of saying to God, look, we wanna thank you. And God just says, sorry, but I'm not interested in your sukkah. It rains and you gotta go inside, right? It's a real slap in the face, right? It's always a big disappointment when it happens. Okay, Gemara, Tanu Rabbanan. Brighta says, Kol shivat yamim adam oses sukato keva ube to arat. Ketzad, now the bright is gonna, Say, how do we do this? I made reference to this before. So, you have nice dishes, bring them to the sukkah. You have nice sheets, bring them to the sukkah. And you eat and drink and hang out in the sukkah. Okay, I want to just mention a little story. When we first got married, we, we, had very, we got nice dishes for our wedding. And my husband insisted the first year that we bring all our dishes to the sukkah. Now we were living in a third floor walk up, no elevator. And we literally slept and not to mention I was pregnant and I had a mild case of mono at the time. And we basically slept our dishes up and down three flights every, you know, for our meals on Sukkot, uh, I guess just our yantif meals. Anyway, it was quite a, a challenge, but we did fulfill this idea of making your sukkah kev uh, and your bay and your bayit arat. Okay. Um, so where does this come from? What's the source? So Detano Rabbanan, now we're going to bring another bride that's going to sound almost the same, but it's bringing the source from the Pasuk. Teshvu, it says, Shivatimim, right? You're supposed to say Teshvu Basukot, dwell. Teshvu ke'en tadu. So they say Teshvu, we've seen this many times. Here's where the source is. Teshvu ke'en tadu, the way that you live, right? You should sit in the sukkah in the way that you normally live during the year. Mekanabu. From here, the bright just continues and repeats what the other bright has said. So we start to see all these things, bring your nice dishes, bring your nice sheets. And uh, you eat and drink, hang out in the sukkah. And this one adds, and you learn in the sukkah. So now the Gemara says, Ini, is that really true? You're supposed to learn in the sukkah? Torah and Mishnah in the Mishnah, uh, in the sukkah. Mitalalta is sukkah. But to really learn in depth, do it outside the sukkah, because it's hard to concentrate in the sukkah and you need concentration. So they say, 
Lokashia ha bimigras ha unit. One is just to review. If you review what you learned, even though, like, let's say you went to a shir where you learned something very in depth, if you're just reviewing what you learned, you could do that in the sukkah. But if you're actually doing the learning itself, then you do it outside the sukkah. Here they're going to bring a story to prove that there's this distinction. It's supposed to be different than the, what it says in the text here. When they would learn in front of Rav Chista, first they would go through very quickly all the stuff he had taught them. And then they would go more in depth about it. So there's two different types of learning. This is what we see. And one will be obligated to sit in the sukkah and the other, which you need more concentration for, you don't necessarily have to sit in the sukkah to do that. With that, have a great day, everyone. We'll meet up again tomorrow.